Well, as I said, I've been waiting to share this meeting with you. I have longed to share it with you. I want to open up with a testimony about a young woman. No, she wasn't a young woman. Well, she was kind of young as far as eternity goes. But uh, she came to the office and she had thyroid. It was just swollen right out on both sides. Her neck was quite pronounced. And she was scheduled for surgery about two months from that time. That's when they would fit her in. And she asked if there was anything she could do. She'd suffered like this, and the doctor saw the condition of her thyroid and wanted to operate. And the reason why is because that is what the doctors are taught. If there's something wrong with an organ, you cut it out and replace it with something, a transplant or a medication or something like that. That's what they're taught. And if you follow that principle, what about migraine headaches and things? What happens there, right? So this woman, quite perplexed, she said, is there anything I can do? I've heard about your center, and that's why I came here. And so I looked at her blood work. I did some blood work on her, and I recommended a special program for her. And she came back in less than two months. It was about six weeks, and her thyroid was totally normal. And she was off her Synthroid, and all of these things, and uh, she was still scheduled for surgery, so she thought she'd keep the appointment to have an ultrasound done. And she went for the ultrasound, and the doctor that did the ultrasound said, what am I looking for here? And she said, well, it's my thyroid. My surgeon wants to have the, uh, um, the, the, the thyroid examined just to see what condition it's in and how you proceed the surgery. So he, anyway, he did the, uh, he did the examination and uh, did the ultrasound and sent the pictures to her surgeon. The surgeon was in touch with her two days later and said, we want you to come in this morning and have your, th or tomorrow morning and have your thyroid removed. And she said, but my thyroid is totally normal now. And he said, yes, it is, but it may get sick again. And so we're just going to remove it to prevent that from happening. And as I think of these things, just inside me, I just churn. Why? Why are these things taking place? Doesn't anybody know the Lord anymore? How can we try and control the body we've never made? You know, we can fix anything we've made. Computer, automobile, church roof. But we didn't make this. The greatest thing we can do is to get out of the way and do nothing intelligently when the body is sick. Fasting, juicing, learning how to take care of the machinery, and doing things that are unheard of. You know, I mentioned to one woman in the office once, she says, I, I couldn't water fast for three days. I'd die. And I said, well, I water fasted for seven days and still worked. And she looked at me gasping. You did? Oh, yeah. Didn't you get hungry? No. Do you know our Lord denied himself for us? Ought we not to deny ourselves, even if it's a little bit, even if it's missing one meal, just to give the body a rest? Be a nice idea, wouldn't it? I counsel you, don't fast with water longer than three days without the supervision of a professional. Not a good idea. You need to know what's happening in your body so you know when to stop fasting. And if you've never done that before, you're walking into dangerous territory when you get uh, past the three days. So just to show you that God's way works, we've seen case after case after case, prostate cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid problems, all kinds of problems, asthma, a nurse who, who taught people how to use puffers. She came to the clinic and her asthma was gone in 10 days. She said, now what do I do? Go back and teach them how to use their puffers when I know different? It's hard. It's really hard. But, you know, stick to the truth and let your life be a witness. Amen. Okay. Now today we're going to take a look at the human body in a different aspect here. How your body can be used to help purify your mind. With many of us, the body has been used to corrupt the mind.
Now we're going to show you how to use it to purify the mind. Get yourself sharp. Get ready. These are all things you can do at home. From the spirit of prophecy, we have this. The affliction of the stomach affects the brain. Impatient words are spoken and unkind deeds are done. Dishonest practices are followed and passion is manifested. And all because the nerves of the brain are diseased by the abuse heaped upon the stomach. That is an incredible quote, isn't it? How related is your stomach to your brain? They are intimately related. And you got to realize that you've got to take control. The brain has to take back control of the body. We're going to show you how to let that happen. In the word of God, it says this, for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Should we have confidence in ourselves? No. Confidence in what God has provided? Absolutely. You see, any leader of a country is judged by what rules and regulations he makes for the citizens of that country. God is being judged by the laws he set up for his creatures. But if his creatures do not follow the laws he set up, then his character cannot be vindicated by the witness of human testimony. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Isaiah chapter 30, 15. That is one of my favorite chapters. Isaiah chapter 30. Absolutely incredible. What a rebuke to me when I studied that. This is the food God designed for us to have. Do you remember about the nutrition aspect we talked about last night? We covered it. Does everybody, anybody was here last night? Yeah, quite a few. So you remember we talked about nutrition and its importance. Do you remember also we talked about exercise, strengthening the body for the winds of strife or the temple? And of course, we talked about drinking water and we talked about what other kind of water? Organic water. Good. Both are necessary. All these things are necessary. Now we're going to take you to a little bit different area. After this person finishes drinking, <laughs> we're going to switch screens. We like to take our time with things sometimes, and she's just about finished. As soon as she gets to the lettuce, or the spinach rather, she's finished. Apples next. There we are. She's finished. <laughs> It is the lack of harmonious action in the human organism that brings disease. The lack of what? Harmonious action. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that the lungs must be working properly. The liver must be working properly. All of the organs must be in harmony, harmonious action. If the liver becomes sick, if it becomes congested, then it brings a burden upon every other organ in the body to help cover for the liver's deficiency. If one of us becomes sick, it's not a matter if you just eat something and you got sick or your life is sick. You affect everybody around you. If you become sick, others have to look after you. And when you think about that in, in sight of eternity, we ought to be helping others, not others helping us. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Paul speaking, Romans chapter 12, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Key focus of this statement, but be ye transformed by the what? Of your mind. Paul says, with my body I serve the flesh, but with my mind I serve God. He says, these two are warring against each other, and I really am quite stressed. 
for what I want to do, I don't do. And what I do, I don't want to do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall rescue me from the body of this death? Christ came to redeem us. Not your elbows and your knuckles and your heart and your lungs, your mind, which is housed in your brain. In the book of, um, I think it is, Second Thessalonians, I believe, or maybe First Thessalonians, the verse says, may your whole mind and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord, right? May your whole spirit and soul and body. If you translate that into modern English, it's this. May your mind and the avenues that feed your mind and your whole body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we're going to start to protect that ever so needed organ, the brain. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Your body cannot disobey the laws of health. Maybe he could have great stress. Maybe his wife's in hospital, breast cancer, having surgery. There's some kind of a worry upon his mind. The countenance expresses what's going on in the mind. Humanity. You see, Jesus was the, he was the express image of God. That's why he was called the Word. Because what words are to thought, Christ was to the invisible God. So he became the expression of God. Mankind was made to be a greater expression of God himself. Man was the crowning act of God's creation. The crowning act. We were to reveal to all the unfallen worlds a greater glory of God. Wow, what a thought. What an absolute wonderful thought. Now take a look at this face. What does that tell you? I know. to say this man loves life this man is worried so just as the the outer expression of your body shows you what's going on inside your mind did you know that your skin can show you what's going on inside your organs your skin is an absolute incredible when people come into the office i try to be nonchalant but and and i, I look at their eyes I look at the pockets below the eyes, color of the skin, the knuckles, around the ears, the neck, if the skin is bare.
just like you tell what's going on in the mind by the expression on the face. These are the organs of the digestive system. And you notice something. Nutrients are digested where? Well, there's a the stomach. The stomach digests protein. In the bowels, right here, the small intestine, a lot of action in there. A lot of action. In fact, nutrients go from there to every single part of the body. Now, the key is you have to have enough nutrients to not only service these digestive organs, but you have to have enough nutrition to service the skin and the muscles. If you don't have enough nutrition in your body, you won't have enough to reach the skin. You won't have enough to reach the outer lying muscles, and you will be sick. So you've got to flood your body with nutrition. You see this river? Notice the tr that where, where all the things are growing. Are they growing far away from the river, or are they growing only close to the river? So where the nutrients are, that's where life springs up. Does that make sense? So then if you've got more than enough food nutrients going through your blood vessels to reach these outer perimeters like the skin, then you're going to have healthy skin. That makes sense. So if you don't have healthy skin, that's got to tell you something very simple. You're not getting enough nutrients to have healthy skin. Here's somebody's back right here. Look at this. Does that look like healthy skin? There's a lot going on in this person's system. It has a weakened immune system and poor circulation. And look at this. Do you like these? Do you know what they're all signs of? We see things like this, by the way, clear up real, relatively fast. It depends on how much vital force a person has left. But it, what it does, it shows that they're eating wrong foods. It shows that they have poor digestion. It shows that there's little to no exercise. And it also shows dehydration of the cells. Now, we talked about all of this, didn't we? But I want to get to you some, with something personal now. How many people would like to look 10 to 15 years younger and have healthy skin? I'm glad to see most of the hands go up. There's a lot of people who don't want that. And we have some of them here today. <laughs> I'm just kidding you, of course. Putting someone in prison may cause a person to alter their behavior so they appear to have changed. But in most cases, the person is still the same inside. Nothing has changed. You know, external behavior is one thing. You say, like, why do I go to church? I'm here. Why do I go? I ask myself a lot of questions. Like I'll say to myself, why do I like the color green? And I try to analyze what prompts me, what has stirred me to like that color. Haven't you ever sought to know yourself? Have you ever asked yourself those questions? Why do I like plaid? Why do I like a house that looks like that? Why? Why? Study to know yourself. Because then you, you understand why you're doing things the way you're doing. Why am I doing this? Is it for personal gain? Am I doing it for the benefit of others? Good questions. So now, here it is. Your skin is going to show you what's going on inside without a lie. A person can look at you and say something, but you don't know what's going on in their mind, really. But the skin doesn't lie. It tells what's going on. So you can put cream on the outside of the skin and all these, you know, facials and things like that, right? But though they are very popular, putting on skin creams and facial masks does not deal with the underlying cause of skin problems. Neither can going to church deal with the underlying cause of sin. The underlying cause is lack of nutrition, spiritual nutrition, to feed the inner and outer self. So the actions correspond with the heart. Ellen White said, the time devoted in studying how to prepare food in a manner to suit the perverted appetite is worse than lost. 
Such knowledge is a cause to parents and ch a curse to parents and children, for they are only learning the most successful way to tear down and debase the physical, mental, and moral faculties by gluttony. Then, as a natural result, comes sickness, and next, the doctor and poisonous drugs. Have you experienced that yourselves? I have. I've experienced that. There is only one disease. Only one. And some people can say, you're crazy. No, I'm not. Diabetes is not a disease. Cancer is not a disease. High blood pressure is not a disease. I know I can sound crazy. But they are not diseases. They are all symptoms. Symptoms of a disease, the only disease, low levels of nutrition. And I'm telling you the truth. Because whenever we have people in the office that have this affliction or that symptom, they always say, what can I do for this? What can I do for that? And I say, why do you want to deal with the symptom? Why not find the cause? And whenever they add good nutrition, guess what happens? They heal sooner or later. As a rule, they heal. In Christian temperance and Bible hygiene, Ellen White had this to say, that which renders the skin dark and dingy also clouds the spirits and destroys cheerfulness and peace of mind. So if you have sick skin, you don't have a mind that's running on 100%. That's, that's a real, it, it's a temperature, it's a thermometer of your body, what's going on. In the same book, she said, sickness is the result of violating nature's law. Nature's law. Nature has laws. Can I share with you a personal testimony? This goes back 40 years. I was a young rock and roller. And I spent 30 years in the music business. A young rock and roller. And I had a rock and roll band. And we were playing at a club in Toronto, Ontario, in a biker club. And we were playing rock and roll music. That's all we had. And we prided ourselves on being great rock and roll musicians. My piano player never took music lessons. And that man could play rock and roll on a piano like you wouldn't believe. He was good. And it was myself on guitar and singing, piano player, bass player who also sang, and a drummer who also sang. And we did all the old tunes. And this was a Saturday matinee. And on a Saturday matinee, if those of you don't know what that is, karaoke. It's karaoke, but with a real live band. And we would party late into the night. And so here was a, we were playing at one o'clock in the daytime. And we weren't used to getting out of bed that early, you know, because we'd be up all night. But here, we were supposed to play and perform for a club. This was one week before Christmas. And the club was jammed on a matinee. And during that time, we had to do what's called the, the happy hour, and they had the beer on sale and the drinks on sale, and the band would play, and people would come up and sing. So we had a matinee happening, and the first person coming up was a person who wanted to sing a Christmas song. Well, she said, I'd like to sing Go Tell It on the Mountain by Mahalia Jackson. And I looked at my piano player, I said, Go tell it on the mountain? We're a rock and roll band. That's southern blues. And so we'd be, and she was going, go tell it on the mountain. And the two did not have harmony at all. It was like we were in a different world. And so I began to sweat a little bit, and I knew how to get out of this. I just gradually play lower and lower and put my guitar down and leave the stage. Let my piano player and bass player and drummer look after this act. And so next thing, my bass player faded out and the drummer just sort of faded out and the three of us were sitting down at the table and my piano player was up on the stage sweating buckets. 
because he couldn't play the southern blues at all. And he was, and everybody in the, in, the, in the club, they knew there was something wrong, even though they couldn't put a finger on it. And this poor woman, she tried and she tried, and, and she was having a hard time, and so was my piano player. I'll never forget one old man, must have been about 50. He was sitting at the front table. Well, I was only about 20 at the time. I'm old, 50, come on. And he had on a pale blue jacket, a white shirt, and a red bow tie, and he was drinking cherry cola in a biker rock and roll club. And he looked really out of place, but he leaned forward and he said to my piano player, would you like me to play, son? My piano player, oh yeah, come on up, come on up. So this man came up and he sat down at the piano and he looked at the woman and he said, I think you were in the key of E flat. I said, how did he know that? And so he starts playing. And he's waiting for her to sing. But she was so taken by the music, she forgot. And so he said, let me play it again. And he played something totally different. My piano player said, hey, he's pretty good. He's pretty good. So he started playing. And this woman, when he counted three, two, three, one, go tell it on the mountain. And this man framed her voice with beautiful piano playing. Absolutely incredible, mistakeless piano playing. It, had play, it seemed like he'd played the Southern blues all his life. And then he'd take it up, he'd modulate it a semitone when it got near the end. Go tell it on the go tell. You know, he was just doing everything wonderful. And the arpeggios he was performing, you could see that he was used to this type of playing. So my piano player said, oh, pretty good blues piano player. Wow. I'm a rock and roller though, he says, you know. And so next thing, she finishes, and this club, they applauded her more than they applauded my band, who had been playing six nights, working hard to earn their applause, and here they were saying, yeah, she's good, she's good. She's good, wait a minute. You know, inside the human pride just wants to, to be acknowledged, you know? So the next person comes up, and this person, she says, I'd like to sing one of Mozart's arias from the magic flute. And you know, I didn't even know that language. But, but the piano player, he said, well, did you bring your music with you? And she said, yes, I have. She rolled out about six sheets of music and the piano player stuck it on the piano and he looked at it and he started playing. She started to sing. Man, did she have a voice. Wow! I never heard a singer like her before. And when she finished, this man, he'd read the music, he'd look at like a whole page, and then he'd turn, he'd just lean back, and he'd feel it. Whoa! And he'd just play and play. My piano player's going, he's not any good, he's really good. You know? <laughs> And the whole club knew it. They were drinking beer and stuff, but they were listening to this act. And this man made her voice even greater. And she just loved what he was doing because she could then get into it. And so when she finished, the club applauded her more than they even applauded, go tell it on the mountain. And so when this lady finished, she sat down, up comes this man, and he says, I'd like to do something from Mammy, how I love you, how I love you, vaudeville. He was a very active type person, you know. So the man says, well, just a second here. Uh, just sing once more. So he's saying, oh, D flat. Okay, okay, D flat. So he says, just one second. He reached inside his pocket. He pulled out a piano hammer. And he retuned the piano honky-tonk in the key of D-flat really quickly. It took him about less than a minute. And then he played ring, ding, 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 mammy. It sounded like vaudeville. And this guy was smiling and playing those ivories like you wouldn't believe. And here he had played, he played southern blues. He had played classical. And both of them very, very well. And here he was playing 
all of the vaudeville like he'd lived it. My piano player was just amazed. I was amazed. This man was a real good musician. Now, after this man, the whole place just, whoa, they were screaming, wow, this is incredible. Well, wouldn't you know it, right after him, another act comes up. And this man has a harmonica with him. And he says, I'd like to play Johnny B. Good. Now, I don't know how many of you know Johnny B. Good, but Chuck Berry, but that is a rock and roll song. And so my piano player, who prided himself, you know, hey, I didn't take any piano lessons. I he says, I'd like to see what this guy does with it. Rock and roll, yeah, right. Well, I want to tell you, when this man said, Johnny B. Good, he says, what key have you got your harmonica in? The piano player said, he said, I'm in the key of C. Now, you don't play rock and roll in the key of C. Maybe E. Maybe G, D, A, but not C. C's kind of a piano key, you know? And so is F. But here he was, the key of C. Well, this piano player, he took off his jacket, whipped off his bow tie, rolled up his sleeves, and he went... Then he turned around and played backwards. Whoa! This, he was just moving... And my piano player was going, oh, he sunk down off his seat. This man even sat down on the floor and was playing the keys like this at one point. And then he'd stand up, he rocked the piano back and forth as he was playing. And the club went nuts. I mean, they lost it. They were standing up, clinking their glasses and whoa, whoa, whoa. And it was the piano player who was making this happen. And I saw and I said, whoa, this guy is good beyond belief for an old man. Whoa, he's good. I wondered, how did he get that good? Never heard a musician like him before. And when he finished, the club gave a standing ovation, not for the harmonica player, not for the person who sang Goat Out on the Mountain. They were applauding the piano player. They saw that he was the key behind all the success. And so then they said, we want the piano player. Just rolls of people. Just, there must have been 300 people in a club that seats 150. And I'll tell you, they said, we want the piano player. So he comes forward and he says, could I play you one of my favorites? And they said, yeah, yeah, go for it. He played all three movements of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Without the music. All three movements, incredible piece of music. And in the middle movement, it's dum da dum dum da dum beautiful piece. And the whole bar was silent. You could hear a pin drop. The bartenders stopped serving beer, and they were just listening. And when he finished, standing ovation must have been five minutes. And so he came and he sat down. He couldn't take any more. He said, no, I got to take a break. So he sat down at the table with us. And I ordered him two cherry colas. <laughs> Go ahead, <laughs> splurge. <laughs> I wanted to know about this man. My piano player looked at me. He said, he said to the piano player, where did you learn to play like that? So this man began to tell him all about, well, I've spent, when I was five years old, my, my parents sent me away to Vienna to music school. And there I began to learn piano. And I began to learn flute. And over the years, I was learning um, all about orchestration, arranging for strings, arranging for woodwinds, arranging for brass instruments, arranging for harp and, and piano, and harp and guitar, and harp and flute, and then conducting an orchestra. Uh, I learned all the scales and modes, and all the different keys, the different idioms, the different styles. I went to Scotland, I learned all about the Celtic music, I went to Ireland. I went to the Caribbean, learned all about the reggae and the calypso music. And he said, and I just, I just learned music, so I spent 30 years studying music, and writing, and arranging for orchestra, and, and all this. And my piano player looked at him. Wow. Wow. And it wasn't until I became a Christian that the lesson hit home to me. This man was operating under the laws of music. He was totally free. He could express himself in a way no one else could if they didn't know the laws and follow them. So my piano player 
saw his loss. His pride had prevented him from the freedom that he thought he had. I'm a, I'm, I'm a rock and roll piano player. I don't have to go to take all the music lessons. I don't have to go to school. I don't have to take the theory. I don't have to take the scales, the arpeggios, the modes. I don't have to take any of that. I'm a rock and roll piano player. He saw his inadequacies by his ignorance. But I remembered God said, if you will walk in my laws, my commandments, my judgments, my statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. You see, God wants to give you the freedom in parallel version like that piano player had. And the, the reason why you want, you want to be free, you can say, well, you, you can't have hamburgers. And I say, yeah, I can't have cancer either. Well, you can't eat ice cream. Yeah, I can't have diabetes either. Do you see the difference? Do the laws not appeal to you? There is your freedom. There is your only freedom. And we think, as rock and roll piano players, well, I'm free to do whatever I want. Well, in reality, we're really not. We are not our own. At the end of that table conversation, my piano player looked at this great piano player and said, what are you doing now? He said, I'm a, a teacher at the Conservatory of Music. My piano player said, are you taking any new students? <laughs> that was the last I heard of him. <laughs> he was gone. I pray that he did well. Tell me something. Do you feel like you'd like to study under the laws of health from your maker? Well, that's what you're getting here. And there is your freedom. Amen. And I tell you, after and I was age 40, I had all the symptoms of colon cancer. I had angina, atherosclerosis, ulcerative colitis, high blood pressure, borderline diabetes, aches and pains everywhere. And in two months of getting away from the world's diet and getting to God's diet, every symptom gone. The disease reversed. And Jeannie and I have been going ever since. We're, we're both workaholics. It's not a good pair, believe you me. <laughs> you can kill each other because always we're coming up with different ideas on things, right? And what to do next. Anyway, there is sickness as the result of violating nature's laws. You want to get back to God. So here is one of the finest pieces of flesh ever to be made is the human brain. If the body is sick, the brain is sick. And if the brain is sick, we cannot discern truth very well. This puts us in danger of misunderstanding the Lord's guidance and direction. N'est-ce pas? In Canada, in French, that means, isn't that right? N'est-ce pas? <clears throat> now, here is a temple. These are all people. See them lined up shoulder to shoulder to shoulder? We'll get a little bit further away from this temple. Here's a, a place where a prophet is buried. This is the same place. I'm pulling away from it here, pulling away. Oh, you see the size of this place? It's filled with people. It is in Saudi Arabia. How many of you know what this place is? It's the mosque of the prophet. Who's the prophet? Muhammad. You're right. Look at this. Look at this building. And they've got polished marble sidewalks in front of the building, all around. Look what they've done to this building in honor of a person, a human being. All this, they have sacrificed greatly because they think so much of Muhammad. Do you realize that we have been given prophecy, a prophetic writer greater than Muhammad? God's mouthpiece, Ellen White. And how many times do we cherish the words that God gave the prophet, really gave a human being? You see, we're not rejecting Ellen White. We reject God, really. And so we need, all of us, every one of us need to turn around and say, what's in my life that needs to change? What do I need to change? Here's this mosque. All this in honor of a man, a dead man. That just blows my mind. What kind of a place is it? 
Just, wow. I want to read this whole thing. Will you read it with me? Early in my youth, I was asked several times, are you a prophet? I have ever responded, I am the Lord's messenger. I know that many have called me a prophet, but I have made no claim to this title. My Savior declared me to be his messenger. Your work, he instructed me, is to, is to bear my word. Strange things will arise, and in your youth I set you apart to bear the message to the erring ones, to carry the word before unbelievers, and with pen and voice to reprove from the word actions that are not right. Exhort from the word. I will make my word open to you. It shall not be as a strange language. In the true eloquence of simplicity, with voice and pen, the messages that I give shall be heard from one who has never learned in the schools. My spirit and my power shall be with you. Be not afraid of man, for my shield shall protect you. It is not you that speaketh, it is the Lord that giveth the messages of warning and reproof. Never deviate from the truth under any circumstances. Give the light I shall give you. The messages for these last days shall be written in books and shall stand immortalized to testify against those who have once rejoiced in the light, but who have been led to give it up because of the seductive influences of evil. Why have I not claimed to be a prophet? Because in these days, many who boldly claim that they are prophets are a reproach to the cause of Christ. And because my work includes much more than the word prophet signifies. When this work was first given me, I begged the Lord to lay the burden on someone else. The work was so large and broad and deep that I feared I could not do it. But by his Holy Spirit, the Lord has enabled me to perform the work which he gave me to do. Notice what she said. My work includes much more than the word prophet signifies. And when I saw the temple erected to Muhammad, I just hung my head. What have we done? We haven't even cherished what the Lord has seen fit to give us. And here's these people that, that don't have Christ as a rule. And they're honoring, following everything that Muhammad says. That's amazing to me. Wow. In the word of God, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. How much sacrifice was put forth to build that temple, that mosque in, in Saudi Arabia? And I say, Lord, why don't we hearken? It's better than sacrifice. To obey brings glory to... Can you see how obeying the health laws brings glory to God? You are made well. Trust in God, what he's given you. It's the only way to have health. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Second Chronicles 20.20. 20. She also said this, the work of health reform is the Lord's means for lessening suffering in our world and for purifying his church. Teach the people that they can act as God's helping hand by cooperating with the master worker in restoring physical and spiritual health. It is a subject that we must understand in order to be prepared for the events that are close upon us and it should have a prominent place. Not at an evangelistic series to give one night to health reform. Health reform should be spoken every single night and the message of health reform should tie in with the doctrinal teaching being taught. It's inseparable. In the early 1900s, the health reform message became separated from the doctrinal teachings of the church when John Harvey Kellogg, who was really into health reform and a brilliant health reformer had such a, a, a dislike for people who weren't into the health reform. And so people began to be separated from it and Satan was delighted. And so from then on, you'll notice the health reform started to leave the doctrinal teachings. I have a goal on my heart 
to unite the health reform back with the doctrinal teachings because when that happens, the devil's going to run like a scared rabbit. He knows that we are powerless as long as we're in disobedience, known or unknown. He knows we don't have the power. But I tell you the truth, once those messages unite, watch out, Satan. The end is right upon you. And I believe it's going to happen in our generation. Amen. Not by condemnation, but by conviction, out of sincere desire to vindicate the character of God, to love him supremely. Amen. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? You know, when we have that attitude, we are no different than Pharaoh. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Wow. 21 days to rebuilding the temple, your body. I'm going to show you now what to do. Are you ready? You got pen in hand? Well, good. Here it comes. For 21 days, your foods must be 80% raw. 80% raw, at least 80% raw. How do you know that? Well, just look at your plate. You can have a pretty good guess as to whether you're having the majority raw or the majority cooked. You are not dummies. You're not stupid. You can do this. God gave you a brilliant machine, better than a Mac. <laughs> and a Mac can do a lot of things, right? Hmm? There are great raw recipe books. When Jeannie and I started doing this work, there was only one raw food book that we knew of, Nomi Shannon's uh, raw food book. And since then, Jeannie's not only written a lot of her own recipes, but she's collected about every book that ever comes out. And she knows raw food really good. She makes sometimes for me for breakfast raw pecan pie. And it is, just, that's my whole breakfast. And people say, what did you have for breakfast? I had pecan pie. And they say, I thought you were a health reformer. Yeah, that's exactly why I had pecan pie. <laughs> they don't get it. It tastes way better than, than the commercial stuff. And she makes raw apple pie sometimes. And she makes a raw fruit pizza that is just to live for. Wow. Beautiful. And she makes a raw regular pizza that is more tasty than the, than the pizzas they make in these restaurants. And she's got a lot of talent when it comes to that. Just amazing. I've got a lot of talent when it comes to eating it, but she's got a lot of talent when it comes to, <laughs> to making it. So now, you must get all of your liquids each day for those 21 days. Remember, three to four cups of drinking water and three to four cups of organic water. All of your liquids every day for the 21 days. Does this sound like a doable so far? Yeah. Now, remember what I said at the beginning of the meetings? If other people don't want to do this, don't look down on them. Don't condemn them. Let them alone. They have to make their own choices. And those who don't want to do it, sit silently by and watch what happens to those who do do it. And if you remain silent, if the time comes that you say, hey, I'd like to try this, you won't have to recant your rebukes to people or statements you've made. And that makes it a whole lot easier to follow the light, isn't it? It's so simple. <laughs> now, you must get a half hour of exercise twice daily. Do your best to accomplish that. Got that? Half hour twice daily. And Jeannie just shared with you why that is. Because it creates healthier bones. Healthier bones, healthier blood. Healthier blood, healthier body. Your lungs and all these tissues are like plants in a garden, like I shared with you. And your blood is the soil. This is going to build healthy blood. Get plenty of sunshine and fresh air daily. And by the way, Sunshine helps to prevent cancer. I sound like a quack sometimes, don't I? But it's true. Sunshine actually prevents cancer. If you're on a world's type of diet, then you're going to build really poor skin, and the blessing God designed is going to become a curse to you. Now, that has a scriptural basis, doesn't it? My blessing shall become curses. 
Wow. And the Bible says how good it is for the eyes to behold the sun. Lots of sunshine, fresh air. Avoid stresses as much as possible. Okay? Stressful situations because you want your body to be storing up nutrients for what's going to come after the 21 days. This is fun. I love this. <laughs> Got that? Avoid stresses as much as possible. Can you do it? You know, the Lord Jesus promised that we would have peace in him. And there he was. He was supposed to save the world. The weight of the world was on his shoulders. And in a storm in the Sea of Galilee, where do we find Jesus? Asleep. But wake up. You're supposed to save the world. Don't you have any stress? No. Father's in control. In fact, when he woke up, what did he say? Oh, ye of little faith. When things don't seem like they're going right, God is right. And he loves you more than you love yourself. He loved the clay more than himself. Gave himself on Calvary. You know, he would rather die than be without you in eternity. What a God. He's worth serving. And he has your best interest in mind. That's why he gave us the health laws. Take a good B vitamin supplement every day. And I'm talking about living type vitamins. Like bee pollen is a good example. Bee pollen, have two tablespoons every day in a green smoothie. One in, one in your morning smoothie, one in your afternoon smoothie if you want. A tablespoon of bee pollen. Bee pollen contains 96 vitamins and minerals in organic living form. That's a great B vitamin. This will help you deal with stresses because when you have stress, all the B vitamins are used up really quickly in your body. Okay? So you want to put in the Bs. <laughs> I'm just thinking about that. The Bs, the B vitamins and the Bs, pollen. <laughs> the B vitamins, B-E-E. -E. Try to get at least eight hours of rest every night. That doesn't mean you have to sleep, but be lying down. If you sleep, that's an even better bonus. And the hours that you get in rest before midnight are better than after midnight. One hour before midnight is equal to two hours after midnight. Got it? So the more you get before midnight, like Jeannie and I love to hit the bed by about 9 o'clock asleep, sometimes 8 o'clock or 8.30. But we don't always get that way. <laughs> you know, we're busy doing things as usual. After your 21 days are up, Fast for three days with just distilled water. That's the tough part. Can you do it? Yeah. Guess what your body's going to do while you fast for those three days? And I want you to take three days where you just drink water, as much distilled water as you can, go for maybe a light walk in the fresh air, but do a lot of resting. If you feel tired, close your eyes and sleep. Remove all things like the news, the newspapers, the telephone, shut off the ringer, get rid of all annoyances, and just concentrate on letting your body heal itself. Doing a nutritional or doing digesting takes up a lot of energy in your system. The average human being in North America produces two and a half gallons of digestive juice every day. That's including your saliva and the juices from the pancreas and the liver and the small intestine, large intestine. All of that is two and a half gallons. The average vegan raw food person can, makes up about one to two cups of digestive juice a day from two and a half gallons to one or two cups. That's a huge difference. That's a lot of energy it takes to digest foods, especially the standard American diet. So if you want to do this, your body's going to have much less digesting to do. And if your body is not focused on digesting food, it's going to be focused on healing itself. And just get ready for what you're going to feel like after day three. Day one, you'll probably feel hungry. But set your mind to do it. Set your mind to enjoy it. 
Because if you go at this with the attitude of, well, I don't really want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I don't want to do it. You won't get a blessing because your brain will prevent you. you go, oh, I don't think this will work. Well, it won't. There was a woman who took a placebo drug for chemotherapy, a placebo, and her hair fell out because she perceived in her mind this is what would happen. And Job says, what I have feared has come upon me, Job 3.25. Wow, how powerful is your brain? Extremely. It'll produce whatever you think. So guard your thoughts. Guard your whole system because all of your cells have a personal uh, communication with your brain. And if you think happy, wonderful thoughts, you increase your lifespan and you actually help your body to heal itself. So if you're going to do the 21 days and the three days of water, that's what you do. Say, I can't wait. Got all my foods. Everything's lined up. I'm going to be walking. I'm going to do everything. Whoa, and I can't wait to get those three days because your body's going to resurrect maybe some symptoms that you haven't had to deal with for a long time. Maybe they were put on hold because you took a drug medication to stop the symptom. And maybe your body will say, okay, I'm going to get rid of this now and it'll resurrect a skin problem or whatever. We had this one young woman who, she had a very congested lymphatic system, had chronic fatigue syndrome, and she, she went to our cleanse center, uh, went through the cleanse program, and when she got home, she knew what would happen by doing all the right foods. Well, wouldn't you know it? But 21 years of age, I think she was, somewhere around there, 21, 22, her skin on her face started to break out on one side, on her right side, and all the way down her neck, and it started to go into her shoulder area. And she had had rashes she'd been dealing with her whole life. So her mother, who also came through the cleanse with her, knew what was taking place. And so they, she said, let's go to Mexico for three weeks. So we took her down to Mexico for three weeks. And during that time, her whole face broke out in blisters. And her whole shoulder, her arm, her neck, she was telling me. And in, she looked like the Phantom of the Opera. One side was just fine, and the other side was just all, all it looked like pusses and all kinds of things happening in her face. But she knew that her body was cleaning poisons out that it didn't have a chance to clean out. Now, this may not happen to you. Your body may cure itself of things over the 21 days. You may put enough nutrition in, enough things to help your body deal with it. But uh, here's what happened to her. In less than three weeks, her skin returned to perfection. She said she went to the mirror to get ready to go back to university, and she looked in the mirror to put makeup on, and she said, why? <laughs> she looked fantastic. When she got to university, her friend said, you look great. What kind of makeup are you using? She said, none. They said, liar. What are you using? Tell us a secret. She says, none. Check my skin. So they did. It was just skin. And they said, what are you doing? So she told them about her diet. And they said, no way. She said, fine. I get all the boys. You lose. <laughs> and she told me that. And it was really interesting because she knew. She embraced it. She said, I know what's going on. She went for it. You know, we need to do these things from time to time. Allow the body a chance to heal. Did not Jesus say, come apart and rest a while? Well, that applies to the physical part too, but I tell you this, I've added something to God's word. I know you're not supposed to do that, but I've added this statement. Come apart and rest a while, or come apart. Right? And that's the truth. You got to get away. And now, I want to get you, I, do you understand everything I've given to you so far? Yes. Does it sound simple? Yes. Is it doable? Yes. Will you do it? Yes. Oh, did you hear all those yeses? Yes. I can't wait to hear the reports coming back from, from Maryland on, on what happened while you were doing your, your cleansing and preparing your body for a clear mind. Because at the end of those three days, it's going to be just like you got a new car. You know, you, you go to the, to the, to the, the food store and, and you park on the far end of the parking lot so nobody will ding your car when they open their doors and things like that. You're going to say, whoa, this body feels clean. I feel energy. Uh, French fries, you've got to be kidding. Uh uh uh. Uh uh. And you'll have a stronger commitment to health reform because it costs you something.
And when you receive the benefit, the blessing contained, it encourages you to go further again. If you wanted to do it all over again after the three days, do 21 days again and go at it again another three days. And if you wanted to do it after that, you could do it again. You know why? You can't overdose on it. It's food. It's under the laws of life. How do you go wrong with that? You can't. The author of life gave those things to us. You know, Jeannie and I are not original. If anybody wants to be original, you have to be really good at hiding your sources. For there's nothing new under the sun, right? Amen. Now, I just want to share with you the greatest part of this presentation. And I pray that your minds are open to hear this. You know, we have a gray cup weekend. And people get the pizza and the beer and the Coke and the chips and they get ready to, to rouse up for their favorite team. And for three days, a long weekend, they go and they get all excited about a pigskin going up and down on a field. And I said to myself, why don't we have a Jesus weekend? This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It didn't say going to church on the Sabbath is eternal life. It said knowing God is eternal life. And so here's what I'd recommend for anybody who wants to do a Jesus weekend. It's a long weekend, a three-day thing, but it's worth it. No TV. No listening to the radio. No telephone. No real big meals, simple fruit. Maybe a, few, a couple of bananas or something for breakfast, something simple. Really, really, nothing you'd have to cook and prepare. Just simply sit and eat. And it should be fruit, ideally, for fruit is so suited to brain work. And here's what you're going to do. When you get up in the morning of that Jesus weekend, don't fall on your knees and pray. Be thankful in heart to God, but get up. Go to your favorite chair, wherever you may be. If you get away from everybody, like a cabin in the, in the wilderness somewhere, just get up, go to a chair, sit down, open up the book of Psalms, and read from the Psalms, starting in Psalm number one, until you find something that touches your heart. And then you go and you pray to the Lord about what just touched your heart. Is this, does this make sense? And then you take with you a book of Bible promises, or maybe you have promises all highlighted in your Bible. Take them with you, and as you go for walks in the fresh air, memorize the promises that mean the most to you. Repeat them over and over again and you will receive a greater understanding of that particular promise like you wouldn't believe, especially if you've been on your 21 days and your three days of water fasting and your mind is clear. God is longing to have his gray cup weekend with his children. He wants to pour out the blessings of heaven, but we're not ready to receive them. We're too busy. And so now on this weekend, Take, the, take instrumental music with you. Instrumental hymns, that is. Nothing that would get in the way of somebody singing and saying, oh, what a beautiful voice. Because when you hear the instrumental hymn, you'll be reminded of the words, not the singer. Do you understand what I'm saying? Focus taken off humanity to Christ alone. Beautiful hymns that he's inspired. And so... You also take with you a copy of the Desire of Ages. And you read about the life of Christ, especially his childhood. And you don't study for long, but you study until you see an attribute, a character part of Christ that really gets your attention, something you admire about his perfect, beautiful character. And as you look at that beautiful character trait that you're admiring, you may discover something very interesting. And that is, that's a character trait that you are missing. Amen. And as you dwell on that, you're going to say, Lord, your character is 
It's just, it's so beautiful. And I like that part about you. Now, this is going to give you, it's going to develop in you a personal prayer talk with God. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. Like the way you handled that woman who was brought in adultery. You are so loving. How your hands were always busy looking after the needs of others, even as a child. Chapter 7, chapter 8. Fantastic. And as you focus on these things, we become changed. The brain will not go any higher than what it focuses upon. The brain will be no greater than what our chief focus in life is. So we're restricting ourselves by what we focus on. If you focus on Christ, you will rise to higher and higher levels of human attainment through the indwelling of Christ. I guarantee you, you will come away from that weekend a changed person. You'll have a closeness to Christ that you never had before then. When it's time to eat, eat with a thankful heart. Study the Bible, pray. Lots of water, drinking water. Don't give your body too much to digest. Let your mind work. Does this make sense to you? Are you going to do it Jesus weekend? Don't you think you're worth it? He's worth it. And he longs to spend that time with his children. So we've talked to you about preparing for the coming of Christ, the three angels' messages. I hope you can see how intimately related health reform is with the three angels' messages. Absolutely undivisible. A health, the health reform was designed to protect the moral law. That's what it's designed for. And I hope now this makes sense to you. Does it? You know, won't it be a wonderful day when in this church, people are standing up giving testimonies of how the Lord has healed them. Instead of prayers for the sick, it'll be prayers of praise. And then I tell you the truth. Will God be able to work more through this church than he has up till now? Without question. Without question. So there you have your 21 days to rebuilding the temple of God. Now from the word of God, it says this. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. Remember I gave you this text? In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. I just pray that there won't be anybody here who says, I will not. I pray we'll say, I will. Jesus longs to draw us close to himself. And the things we presented here this weekend are designed with that specific purpose in mind. When you see the events of prophecy unfolding, coming near the end of the world, those events unfolding is not the reason why Jesus is coming. Those events that are unfolding do not show us that the end is near as much as it shows us. These events only come to pass because Jesus has a people who are ready for those events to come to pass. And you have to ask yourself the question, am I one of those? What we've given you will help you prepare for the coming Christ in great glory. Oh, that day when we shall all see him with open face, beholding as in a mirror. You know, when God created us, we have such a brain that whatever we see, we desire. But in an unfallen state, we would have been beholding Christ and wanting his character to be ours. But in a fallen state, we behold the neighbor's RV. got to have one of those over here. So we start beholding things that God never wanted us to behold. And the devil knows how, how plastic our brain is. How we readily adapt to the wrong things. And so he tries to keep them before us. 
but in God's mercy, he brings the truth before you in love. And he asks you, please, my child, please come, get under my shadow and bring glory to my name. Amen.